Thank you for having me here and greetings to everyone. Uh, my intent is to hold forth a little bit, including with an experiential practice, one of my favorite mini micro meditations, 3Ms, I guess. Uh, anyway, mini micro meditation. Uh, and then open it up for questions and discussion uh, through the chat feature. So if you just type in your comments, so uh, other people can see them. Uh, you can message me privately if you like, although I, I'm probably not going to be able to respond to you individually, but I'll see it. And um, uh, certainly also, please put in your, your questions here. So if I can, I'd like to read first few paragraphs from the opening chapter of the book. Uh, I won't blather on too long. And then uh, I'll do a little practice with you and then use that as a way of talking about these seven strengths that the book is about, seven qualities that we can develop in ourselves, which when perfected, in my view, are a very useful and powerful way to understand the peaks of human potential and enlightenment and full awakening itself. So here we go. <clears throat> the first chapter is titled, Mind in Life. I've hiked a lot in the mountains, and sometimes a friend farther up the trail has turned and looked back and encouraged me onward. Such a friendly gesture. Come join me. Watch out for the slippery ice. You can do it. I've often thought about those moments while writing this book, which is about the heights of human potential, about being as wise and strong happy and loving as any person can ever be. If those heights are like a great mountain, awakening is the magnificent journey that carries you along toward the top. Many real people have gone very far up, the great sages and teachers throughout history, as well as others no one has heard about, and I imagine them turning with a sweet smile and beckoning us to join them. Those who have climbed this mountain come from different cultures and have different personalities, but they all seem alike to me in seven ways. They are mindful. They are kind. They live with contentment and emotional balance through even the hardest times. They are whole and authentic. They are present here and now. They speak of feeling connected with everything and a light shines through them that does not seem entirely their own. Remarkably, you can see these same seven qualities inside yourself, even if they're covered over with stresses and distractions. These ways of being are not reserved for the few. They are opportunities for all of us, and we can explore how to develop them in seven practices of awakening, steadying the mind, warming the heart, resting in fullness, being wholeness, receiving nowness, opening into allness, and most profoundly of all, finding timelessness. The complete development of these seven ways of being marks the pinnacle of human possibility, which could be called enlightenment or full awakening. Meanwhile, even the first simple sense of them is very useful in everyday life. For instance, while dealing with stressful challenges, it's so good to rest in the fullness of feeling already peaceful, happy, and loved. And whether it is for the beginning of the path or its end, Today, we have an unprecedented opportunity to explore a kind of reverse engineering of awakening that is grounded in the living body. So what the book's about is developing these seven qualities wherever we are, is the next step. I think of um, the picture that on the cover, they did a great job with the cover, the publisher, Penguin Random House. and. Um, you know, there are many roots of the mountain of awakening, if we think of it in the broadest sense. So there's the Buddhist root, there's the secular root, there's the roots from, of the native people, the first people around the world, there's the Christian 
root and so forth and so forth. Many different roots, many different traditions, okay? And yet, again and again and again, on all of those roots, people who are walking them, starting down in the dusty plains, moving up into the foothills, and then moving up into the higher reaches of human possibility, no matter what route we take, we find the same seven steps taken again and again and again. Steps of steadiness, lovingness, fullness, by which I mean contentment and equanimity together. Steps of wholeness, nowness, allness, and even timelessness. And we can develop these qualities in ourselves by taking these steps and receiving into ourselves the sense of steadiness, wholeness, timelessness, etc., etc., so that more and more this becomes the habit of our heart. So I'd like to do a little practice with you that will illustrate some broad points. Then I'll explain the seven steps, the seven ways of being that get cultivated uh, in the book, uh, including some very cool, interesting recent neuroscience. And then we can open it up for questions, situations, comments, and so forth. Uh, the sweep of this book is quite broad. Uh, it's a real culmination book for me. It pulls together many things I've worked with, and it pulls together uh, many things I've learned from my own teachers at the, at the highest level. Uh, also, I should add that I've taught this material experientially in a 10-day meditation retreat, and you can see the result of that in this online, very well-structured, cool program that was based on the videotaping of that meditation retreat and some special practices and special bonuses and so forth. And the book and that online program are, are a particularly good combination, uh, you know, because a book itself is not that experiential, but in fact you can engage this material very experientially in ways that will make a big difference for you over time. So speaking of experiential, uh, this is a meditation in three breaths, three simple breaths. It'll take more than three breaths for me to describe it to you initially, uh, but then we'll, and then we'll do it all together in just three breaths, one after another. So you want to try it? You don't have to do it. Uh, you could do it with your eyes open or closed. Uh, and like anything, see for yourself what's useful. And also think of it as kind of an experiment where you try to do something and also, you observe your own mind, and you see what happens when you try to do it. Whatever happens is a learning opportunity. Here we go. First breath, breathing while feeling your chest as a whole. In the second breath, breathing while feeling caring, keeping it simple, focusing on the feeling, maybe with particular awareness of the area around your heart, maybe with a hand on your heart, being aware of someone you like, maybe love, perhaps have compassion for, breathing while feeling caring. And then in the third breath, breathing while feeling cared about. This might be a little more challenging at first, uh, bringing up what it feels like to be with someone who likes you, maybe a group of friends, maybe your, your pet, uh, could be your partner, could be a teacher, someone who's appreciated you. Uh, breathing while feeling cared about. For example, in the background, you might hear my neighbors who care about me in a neighborly way, and they also care about their dog, who they're calling right now. So let's try it again from the beginning. Three breaths, one after another. I'll maybe close a window in a minute here. Breathing while feeling your chest as a whole.
Breathing while feeling caring. And breathing while feeling cared about. Good. That was the experiment. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what plausibly was happening inside your body, particularly your nervous system and its headquarters, the brain, while you were doing that, and therefore why to do this kind of practice and why to prioritize these kind of practices or isolate or zero in on certain elements in commonly taught practices, like being aware of the body while you breathe, uh, for the aspects of those practices that neurologically informed um, can have the most impact. So when we feel um, our chest as a whole as we breathe, that draws us into interoception, which is distinct from awareness of sensations on the exterior of the body. We're going into the interior. And so as you bring attention internally, you tend to activate a part of the brain called the insula. There are two of them technically, one on either side of the brain, kind of on the inside of the temporal lobes as they wrap inside. And when we activate the insula to tune into internal sensations, that does a number of really useful things. One, it brings us into sensation. So the sense of sensation or the volume on that track of the song of experience gets turned up, which dials down inner speech, the voice in the back of the head, that inner chatter. And as that inner speech tends to reduce and the sense of sensation tends to increase, we tend to be less stressed. We tend to suffer less. Uh, because very often it's that voice in the back of the head that's driving a certain amount of um, stressfulness and, and discontent. Right there. Second thing that happens when you go into the insula through interoception is that it's like a circuit breaker that reduces activity in the default mode network, which is in the midline toward the back and spreading to the sides, which is a part of the brain that's active when we are daydreaming or negatively ruminating. And research shows that the more that people tend to be, uh, have a wandering mind, which is to say the more that default mode activity is increased, so on average, as a correlation, um, unhappiness and mental health issues of various kinds um, tend to increase as well. So from a pragmatic standpoint, well, there is a place for going into the ruminator, I call it, the simulator, running little mini-movies, little thought bubbles. Uh, there's a place for that a little bit. We tend to do it much more than is really optimal for ourselves or for other people because also in the ruminator, that's where we develop these you know, resentful cases and righteous cases about other people. So one breath internal sensations with insula activation increasing, decreasing default mode network activation, less rumination. As interoception goes up, rumination goes down. And as rumination goes down, typically so does suffering of various kinds as well. Oh, pretty good. Also, when just the first breath still, you get in touch with something as a whole. So feeling your chest as a whole as you breathe. And by the way, you can expand this practice very usefully. I have a number of meditations in the book that, that are about this kind of thing. You get a sense of your body as a whole, or if you like, the room as a whole, or just the whole field of awareness as a whole, any kind of gestalt, any kind of sense of things as a whole, several things happen there. One is that when we get a sense of things as a whole, like the chest as a whole as we breathe, that tends to increase activity 
in the right hemisphere of the brain for right-handed people because that's the hemisphere of the cortex that's involved with um, gestalt processing, holistic processing. Therefore, the right hemisphere tends to do or be more involved with imagery because images come to us as a whole. Unlike the left hemisphere for right-handed people and some left-handed people, which is specialized for sequential processing, part by part by part by part. Right hemisphere doing synthesis, well, you know, I'm way simplifying, but you get the idea, things as a whole. Left hemisphere, more analysis, deconstructing, breaking things down into parts, and then, you know, with the help of the right hemisphere, assembling them into a whole. The left hemisphere is specialized for language because language comes to us sequentially. Uh, the left hemisphere has a certain specialization for fine motor function and um, executive control because that tends to occur procedurally. All right, we need both those hemispheres. One is not good, the other is not bad. We need them both, that's fine. Except most of us, me included, have had a lot of training in left hemisphere activation. The same principle, by the way, applies to many left-handed people. It's just hemispherically reversed, but the same point is valid. Takeaway here is that when we move into the sense of things as a whole, we tend to reduce stressful, task-oriented doingness. Um, we tend to uh, get out of the verbal activity centers in the left hemisphere, which also tends to reduce inner speech, which you know makes us nervous and preoccupied and caught up with ourselves with a lot of me, 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 me. Just right there, right hemisphere, bingo, sense of things as a whole. Also, really interesting, when we get a sense of things as a whole, that tends to reduce activity in the midline of the cortex altogether, including the regions more toward the front, unlike the default mode territory in the back, regions in the front that are engaged with task-oriented doing, uh, which, of course, needs to occur. That said, a lot of us included are really caught up in task-oriented doing. And whether it's in the front of this midline cortical ridge or in the back, the default mode area, there's a lot of what's called mental time travel going. When we've got this midline activation, we're in the future, we're in the past. But when we come out of this midline activation through getting a sense of things as a whole, we tend to move into networks, they get more active on the sides of the brain, especially right-sided, because sense of things as a whole, right hemispherically specialized. And as we come into this uh, activation of these networks on the sides, the lateral uh, sides of the brain, activity in the midline decreases, which whoof, brings us into the present and reduces all kinds of self-referential processing that occurs supported by these midline networks. Suddenly, we're taking life less personally. Suddenly, there's less of a self-preoccupation and a narrative about self that, that's about me, myself, and I, and what I, you know, how people are treating me and the rest of that, just through taking one breath in which we're getting a sense of things as a whole. And um, in my book itself, there are tons of references in the back. Um, I'm a senior fellow of UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. You know, I need to represent, I need to have some references. So there are zillions of references in the back. You can check them out. But the essence is really simple. It's remarkable that uh, through understanding more exactly what's actually happening in the hardware, we can be more motivated to do certain kinds of practices that may well have been recommended to us by one teacher or another, but maybe we weren't so motivated to do them, in part because we didn't understand the why, the underlying why. And on the basis of understanding the why, we can shift our practices maybe in the direction of something that's gonna bear more fruit for us. Um, I, for myself, uh, used to meditate a, a lot mindfully on sensations around the lip and the nose, and there's value in that. But that's exteroception, particularly, and I found myself getting drawn more and more into uh, dwelling in as a 
anchor for attention, the sensations of breathing in my body as a whole, particularly the internal sensations, the chest rising and falling, uh, the feeling of cool air coming in and warmer air going out, um, that became more of a focus for me and has really served my meditation too to get that sense of a whole. That's just the first breath. I'm going to name uh, the next two breaths quickly and then see if there's some comments or questions. I hope you got some questions coming in here. Looking really good. All right. Uh, so, feeling while breathing while caring, breathing while feeling cared about. Yeah. So, when we feel caring, we tend to have more activity of oxytocin in the brain. Also, when we feel more cared about, oxytocin is a neurochemical uh, that when its activity rises, typically we feel less anxious because as oxytocin activity increases in prefrontal regions right behind the forehead, um, we tend to feel less anxious. And also, uh, there are receptors, receptors for oxytocin in the amygdala the alarm bell of the brain, again, two amygdalae, one on either side. Most things in the brain above the brain stem, just about everything above the brain stem, comes in pairs, you know, sort of like Noah's Ark, um, you know, uh, like two by two, so there are two amygdalae, and so forth. So these receptors, like little docking stations whereby, you know, little packets from container vessels, container ships come drifting across the tiny little gap between two neurons, the synapse, uh, that gap being so tiny that several thousand of them uh, could fit within the width of a single hair. Little container vessels of oxytocin drift across because of increased oxytocin activity, because you're feeling caring or cared about, fine. And as those little container vessels of oxytocin dock at those receptor sites, the activity that ensues is inhibitory. It's calming. It mellows out the amygdala. So it's not so cranky. It's not so reactive. It's not so sensitized, which helps us feel calmer and more centered through increased oxytocin activity, uh, mobilized plausibly to some extent. Um, you know, neuroscience is a baby science. There is so much we don't know, but what I'm saying is plausible, and the risks of trying it are really low, so why not give it a whirl, even if all the mechanisms of action are much more complicated than the one or two simple things I'm mentioning here. Why not give it a whirl? Additionally, uh, besides this oxytocin process, there's activity involving the vagus nerve complex. This is a very a significant part of the nervous system, especially for us very, very social monkeys. Uh, the vagus nerve, to summarize a lot, a lot of stuff, uh, has essentially two branches, both of which originate in the brainstem. The older branch heads downward, and it innervates it you know its little tentacles are woven through the heart and the lungs and the viscera in general and that branch uh, that ancient branch of the vagus nerve complex has a, a kind of calming and uh, uh, slowing effect then the second branch of the vagus nerve complex wandering up into the head and the face the root of the word for vagus in Latin is wandering, so it's a wandering nerve, um, is very involved with social engagement and uh, tracking subtleties of prosody, of sound intonations, like the difference between ah or huh, right? You know, the difference between those two, uh, the vagus nerve helps us track that, and it's very involved with the social engagement system. Well, what this means, is that when we are heightening our sense of positive social experiences, caring flowing out, caring flowing in, we tend to increase activity in the more recent branch of the vagus nerve complex, maybe even hardly with, without even noticing it as we feel caring or cared about, our face softens, you know, which then feeds back into the vagus nerve. Well, the activity in this more recent branch 
ripples down you know, into the lower branches of the vagus nerve complex and through other means as well. Um, there is a kind of a calming and a centering effect when we feel cared about. Much as, turning the other way, if we do deliberate practices such as long exhalations that tend to really calm the visceral core of the body, that can often help us be more available for a relationship, in part because we feel more centered and grounded over here, so we can be more open, more open-hearted and available for a relationship over there. All right? Interesting. How much, right, is just in three breaths, including having a sense of what's going on uh, underneath it all. Uh, so I'd like to mention the seven practices and just kind of quickly explain and, and draw you into a feeling of each one of them and then see if Jacob has any comments or we can open it up for, for questions or comments uh, from you all uh, here today. Uh, and for sure this won't go on overly long, probably another 15, 20 minutes or so and then we'll, then we'll wrap it up. So briefly these seven qualities that I, I said I think we can see in just about anyone who's very far along in their practice, and we can feel the longing in our own heart to develop them. So I want to kind of name them almost as an incantation uh, to over the, the next couple of minutes and encourage you to see if you can get a feeling for each one. Some of them probably are more accessible. Some of the seven are more accessible than others. Uh, the f ones I first named tend to be foundational. The others tend to be more subtle. I'm, I'm really trying to operationalize awakened consciousness, uh, even at the very, very highest levels, with respect, with respect. I draw on the guide up the mountain of awakening that I've uh, learned in the Buddhist tradition, particularly the um, original teachings of the Buddha in what's called the Theravadan, kind of earliest branch of Buddhism, before Tibetan, Mahayana, Chan, China, Zen, and even Pure Land forms uh, developed. Uh, I appreciate all those forms. I'm just more knowledgeable about roots Buddhism. And there are, of course, other guides or other maps up the Mountain of Awakening. Um, but in the tradition I know, for example, and that's the map I drew upon, not to try to persuade anyone to Buddhism, but more just to use it as a guide, certainly we can see these qualities developed in people that are very, very far along, and you can see similar things in Sufism, Hinduism, um, Judaism, you know, Islam in general, Christianity certainly, these descriptions of people who are really far along, they tend to converge. You know, whatever route you take, you tend to converge uh, as you approach the summit in terms of who you are. All right, so I'll mention the seven and then see if we have some questions or comments so far. Steadying your mind. What does that feel like? Present, mindful, whew, here. Moment after moment, sound after sound, steady. Warming your heart. Open-hearted steadiness with compassion and awareness of suffering and warm-heartedness toward it. Helpfulness if one can. Love. Friendliness. Seeing good in others. Warming your heart. Knowing what that's like. Resting in fullness, by which I mean a quantumous well-being that's honest, that recognizes challenges and deals with them on the basis of an underlying peacefulness, contentment, and love. Experiences can come through us, but in the core of our being, we're not disturbed about being disturbed in a sense. We've established a fundamental fullness and equanimity. You can get a sense of that, steadiness, lovingness, and fullness. Then the next three also kind of hang together. Feeling whole, undivided, even resting in a sense of your consciousness as a whole, moment to moment. 
your mind as a whole. What's that feel like? There you are, right at the front edge of now, continually updating your consciousness as the present streams on by, accepting impermanence, being okay with radical ephemerality, radical transience of all experiences, disappearing even as they occur, as the next one endlessly is renewed, continually arises. Hmm, receiving nowness in the freshness of the present. Yeah, how's that feel? While opening into allness, recognizing that, yeah, there's this particular body-mind process, and still this body-mind process is um, open and entwined with and rippling along with all these other threads in the tapestry of reality altogether with less and less sense of self and more and more sense of being lived by and buoyed by and supported by all things, even as one faces difficulty and challenges and kind of partitions out something to deal with, while also recognizing its interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, with everything else. That's opening into allness. And by the way, there's some amazing and interesting recent science about what's happening inside us, including in terms of peak experiences of oneness with everything that people report. Some people report these uh, around the world, um, there's, in, as well as a recent science about what it is to be, have more of a diffuse in a healthy way, permeability with everything. And then timelessness, finding timelessness. What's that intuition of stillness? Timeless, therefore eternal. Stillness, a sense of what is unconditioned, unfabricated, not subject to arising and passing away. What might that be? Within ordinary reality of the Big Bang universe, full of wild and remarkable stuff, but still the conditioned ordinary reality, how can we find that which is effectively unconditioned, such as the field of awareness through which conditioned experiences pass, and potentially, potentially, if you have a feeling for it, and, and I do, a sense of the transcendental, that which is meaningfully distinct from ordinary conditioned reality, the absolute, the ultimate, the infinite, the ground, if you will, the divine. So those are the seven, steadiness, lovingness, fullness, wholeness, nowness, allness, and timelessness. These are available to us all and they can become increasingly developed and increasingly established inside us through our practices. To finish here, I'd like to just quote Milarepa, the great Tibetan teacher who is describing his life of practice. And I think it's a wonderful description of what is the possibility. He said, in the beginning, nothing came. In the middle, nothing stayed. In the end, nothing left. That was his fundamental process of development. When we start, we may not be able to experience these seven qualities at all. Then in the middle, we're able to experience them uh, if we're deliberate about it, uh, maybe while listening to a meditation or while bringing our mind to it in particular. And then increasingly, they are established in us. They've moved from states to traits. We've developed traits of steadiness, lovingness, wholeness, access to timelessness, and then they don't leave us. They're with us wherever we go. For our own sake, and that, of course, for the sake of others as well. So, I want to hear from you. Um, if Jacob may have some commentary, he may come back in and or we could take some chats. Um, I see the chats coming in and I think I will respond to them. Okay, great. I've seen a few coming in. So <clears throat> I want to respond first to Amy and I think other people can see uh, Amy's question here too. I'll just read it though. As you mentioned the insula, I felt pressure on both sides of my head. So glad for this knowledge. I am a striver, 
So then if I were to be in the being mode instead of the doing mode, would that be coming from the insula area instead of the midline? So Amy's knowledgeable about some of my material and she's calling out a informal distinction I've made between being and doing. If you think about it, the midline uh, activity is very much involved with doing of different kinds or another, whether it's goal directed in the front or just kind of fantasizing, a, fantasizing about one thing we might do or another based on the default mode. On the other hand, when that activity decreases, um, we and we move more into the lateral activation of net neural networks, we move more into a sense of being. We're just present, we're in the now, uh, being can be the context of doing. It's very hard for doing to be the context of being. Doing tends to crowd out being, so it's really important to establish being as your field or frame in which necessary bits of doing can occur. Um, so Amy's question about, and, you know, she, the insula is on the inside. Uh, I think of the whole brain obviously is working together. It's really important here, but I and I there's so much that. We don't know. Neuroscience is a baby science, as I've said. Uh, but it is plausible to me that as we increase activity of the insula, you know, we're kind of heightening um, that aspect of the stream of consciousness, we're going to be moving more into being because we're more engaged with what's it feel like to be, to be us, most primally through interoception the underlying visceral state of the body. You know, as soon as you start drawing awareness or returning awareness into the internal uh, visceral state of the body, that tends to move you into being because that is so foundational. We are being alive. And so, yeah, I think actually that's very cool, I mean, that you're heightening that, you're highlighting that, that as we do things that can activate the insula, such as through interoception, that tends to naturally draw us more into a felt sense of being. It's great. Okay, another comment question. Da, da, da. Um, great, great, great. How does consuming a lot of social media and computer screen time impact the brain? Hi. That's a major area of interesting work. Uh, one of the foundational um, essays about this, which has become you know, somewhat well known, it was something the essay I believe was titled, Is Google Making Us Stupid? I confess I forget the name of the author. Uh, Jacob might be able to find it because I think that person wrote a book related to that. Um, we did not evolve to be doing what we're doing right now looking at a two-dimensional image, uh, you know, keyboarding, bouncing around from this to that, right? We did not evolve to do it. We evolved, we have a hunter-gatherer brain. We have a Stone Age brain. Um, now, you know, operating at warp speed with multitasking in the 21st century. There's a lot about the 21st century I like. I like being able to communicate with you in this way. I like, um, you know, being able to uh, at least in my own privileged, fortunate circumstances, be able to kind of lift something and fresh water comes out of a pipe. Like, that's pretty cool. Um, so there's parts of it I like. On the other hand, I think it's really helpful to acknowledge that we live in profoundly different ways and how we raise our children, how we act with each other, what we deal with all day long. Um, and gradually, uh, for better or worse, uh, on the worst side of it, that can be stressful to us and can gradually train the brain in problematic ways, that it becomes habituated to a very intense and dense stream of incoming information. So anything less than, you know, the channel changing, anything less than the new, the new, the new, the new, can start feeling really slow and boring. It's a, you look at a movie that was made in the 1980s and compare a movie today, a popular film in the 80s, let's say, or today, 30 years later, 40 years later, potentially. And you can see that older movies, they have longer takes, their, their cuts are not so quick. These days, uh, boom, 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 cut, 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 because people otherwise kind of feel a little bored while watching it. Um, so it is really concerning 
it is really concerning. The specific effects on the brain uh, basically involve dopamine. Uh, we're getting dopamine hits quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, there are other systems in the brain that are involved. For me, the takeaway here is to reclaim a certain autonomy, to reclaim for ourselves regulation of our own attention and well-being from the inside out. So we get control of where we allocate our attention and we can help ourselves feel content and fulfilled, independent of whether we're being stimulated by the next shiny object. And this kind of uh, learning and reclaiming of the autonomous and less dependent roots, dependent on external conditions, roots of our, of our well-being is, in my view, really important in technical go, 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 industrialized societies uh, and cultures, and in particular, this reclaiming of the deep roots of self-reliance, the deep roots of a kind of independence in um, our own well-being and resilience is more important than ever during a time of plague when we're thrown more than ever on our own resources and we're less supported uh, by external conditions um, and may well be in a country like America in which uh, it's really kind of a mess at the federal level in particular in terms of helping people deal with this, with this pandemic. So we're kind of more on our own and I think it's more important than ever to get control of where we allocate attention and through mindfulness training. Get used to feeling okay when it's not so stimulating. The sensations of breathing are not very stimulating. Just being in the present. <laughs> Not much going on, right? <laughs> and so it's, I think, really important to be able to become increasingly comfortable in that way. And so then we're at choice. When it's time to get busy and active and process a ton of information, I can go there. Okay, we could do that. But when it's time to disengage, <sighs> slow it down and come to a place inside that feels more peaceful and kind of quiet. Thank you. You know, we're able to do that as well. Okay, maybe one or two more people. I know we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon. Yes, Nicholas Carr, marvelous writer. Um, you know, is Google making us stupid? Great. And he wrote a book related to that. Um, great. Wonderful writer. All right, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains by Nicholas Carr. That's right. Okay. Um, so someone asks uh, Nasrin, sorry about the mispronunciation probably of there of your name. When you talk about breathing, the inhale and exhales from the nose or mouth. So there are lots and lots of techniques around the world, including techniques related to breathing, sometimes called pranayama, as you probably know, through um, the Hindu tradition broadly. Okay. Um, one of the things you find when you learn more about the brain is you find yourself uh, coming to a method or a technique and you realize, oh, I heard about that already, or my teacher told me to do that, or my kindergarten teacher, phew, she was a master of that. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, you didn't invent it, but now you understand why it works and why it's important to do. It's like the T.S. Eliot line that at the end of our journeys, we find ourselves where we started, but we know the place truly for the first time. Okay, so breathing techniques, all kinds of breathing techniques. What I was suggesting was as you breathe in a very natural way, however it is that you breathe, maybe you're a mouth breather, maybe you're not, um, however it is you're breathing, can you be aware of the feeling of your chest as a whole? And it can be oddly difficult in the beginning especially to have a sustained sense of a field of sensation as the whole field in which many little sensations are occurring. This is natural to do with imagery or visual um, phenomena. We're aware of the visual field as a whole in which there are many little elements in it. 
In much the same way, we can become aware of the field of sensation, the whole gestalt, the unified field of sensation in which there are many sensations in it. In the beginning, this can be a little difficult, although I suspect people who have very body-oriented practices, like do a lot of yoga or athletics, or whole body athletics, uh, or um, Pilates or dance or movement, or, or, or are out in nature a lot, probably have more of an easy facility with the sense of the body as a whole. But that said, it is something that can be developed. Now, all that said, you know, my suggestion was very simple. You can add specific elements to it from pranayama training or other trainings you've gotten where, for example, you might breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth, or vice versa. You might like to extend the exhalation. You might like to take several big breaths as you feel your chest as a whole, and maybe your body as a whole. All that's pretty cool, pretty cool. And you might notice different, different results from different practices. One simple thing to do is to extend the exhalation. As we extend the exhalation, uh, we tend to get calmer. The heart tends to slow uh, its rate. Uh, that tends to engage um, through association indirectly, the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Good stuff helping us become calmer and more centered. All right, I'm gonna finish up in a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to say, uh, definitely before I go, is a shout out for Banyan Books, wonderful bookstore, and also more generally, at all times it's important to find refuges, and the weirder it is out there, or frankly the weirder it might get in here, the more important it is to find refuge of one thing or another. Places, people, activities, ideas, practices, whatever they are for you. And growing up for me, reading was one of probably my two major refuges as a kid, the other being um, the outdoors, the orange groves and the hills around my home with a background sense of taking refuge uh, in my parents who I knew uh, loved me, um, uh, you know, as I grew up. But reading, fantastic refuge, and hallmark locations, bookstores and libraries. I love bookstores. Don't you feel great when you walk into a bookstore, a clean, well-lighted place? I think that's maybe a line from Shakespeare. Anyway, uh, you know, bookstores, fantastic. So I really support Banyan. They're a major institution in Vancouver and in Canada altogether. Wonderful place. I hope you'll support them as well. I'm very grateful for them for hosting me, and I'm grateful more broadly for those who have written books and offered books. Um, I've gotten so much out of books. Uh, I always have a novel going, um, one kind or another, usually a couple. Currently, I'm reading Pen Chico uh, uh, about life in Korea and four Koreans in Japan. Da, 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 beautiful, beautiful book, getting a lot out of it. Anyway, thank you, Banyan Books, and thank you, Jacob, for organizing this, and thank those of you who are present here. So let's see if there's any last thing to speak to, and we'll wrap it up, okay? So let's see. One last question comment from Rima. Uh, hopefully I'm not mispronouncing that too much. What can you suggest when in a severe amygdala hijack? Okay, you bet. I've done many years of personal growth work, including quite a bit of yours. What, you're not cured? What? No, it's an ongoing process. This side of full, my definition of full, absolute awakening, which is less common, I think, than getting an Olympic gold medal, but is that there's an irrevo irrevocable transformation such that a mind is no longer capable of an amygdala hijack, as it were. Um, enlightened beings still experience physical pain and even emotional pain as best we can gather, and including the emotional pain of compassion. Who would want to have a heart so equanimous that it cannot feel compassion for the suffering of others and, and be troubled by it, right? I'm not there yet myself, so I too can get an amygdala hijack. Uh, I can think of one day before yesterday, for example. Anyway, um, so people have done work great. In the past year, I've had a focus on working with effortless mindfulness 
and is taught by Locke Kelly, who's a wonderful teacher, including non-dual teacher, uh, there is greater safety for, for buried trauma to arise and eventually assimilate with effortless mindfulness, kind of uh, resting in awareness itself a lot. Okay, so this has happened, uh, a release of many traumatic memories in dreams or awake. When in the midst of a big one, it's really challenging to rein things back in for a while. Yeah. So Rima, I think, is speaking here about a broad, um, some really useful, general, generally ap applicable teachings. First, it's helpful to develop that steadiness of mind, in, which is a foundation of any real autonomy amidst interbeing and relatedness to others. Um, so we're developing a steadiness of mind, including a sense of effortless stability, ongoing real-time mindfulness, which is grounded in a, a felt sense of, a, of the light of awareness shining through, grounded in a feeling of um, presence and abiding as awareness in which experiences are flowing. Those are really, really useful things. As we become more stable in that, as Rima is pointing out, and as many people have observed in their own experience, more stuff can bubble up. And sometimes it can be really kind of a lot, like drinking, trying to drink from the fire hose. It's just a lot. And thus the phrase amygdala hijack. All right. And what to do about it. Um, one thing is to uh, ride out the storm, as, as you know, Rima. It's just have 1% of you rested in stability of awareness, knowing why you're feeling it, because you're releasing it as you're feeling it. You're experiencing it out. And so in a weird kind of way, it's a blessing to be upset, because that's how we clear that old buried crud. We have to feel it at least a little bit on its way out the door for it to really resolve and to be cleared out. Um, and then, very important, as the storm has passed, as, in effect, the weeds have been pulled, plant flowers in the space that remains. Receive into yourself something that's wholesome and beneficial, sometimes um, directly matched to that which is past. So for example, if a storm of anxiety and fear has passed, replace it as one best one can, turn one's attention to feelings of peacefulness and safety and strength and protection and fundamental all rightness in the core of your being, no matter what else passed through. That's really useful. Another thing is to give yourself permission to feel it for a breath or a minute or a day, and then that's enough for now. Uh, I feel like I had a bucket of tears from childhood, you know, when I landed and adulted in a sense, and I emptied it one spoonful at a time. I, I think I might have a few more spoonfuls left, but, you know, I've been <laughs> at it for many years now. And so the takeaway point about that is to realize that, you know, <clears throat> maybe you can just bear it for a minute, and that's that, and, you know, guess what? It's time to change the channel and put a comedy on. <laughs> or, or what I mean is, you know, have a cup of tea, take a breath, go for a walk, look out the window. Maybe what you're feeling will move more to the background just as a kind of a mood, but it's not invasive, it's not overwhelming. Give yourself permission to do that, that's very important. Another thing is to think about who's with you as you bear your pain. To try to tap into the felt sense of allies both ones outside you and those inside you who are with you, who are bearing witness with you, who are appreciating your courage and your, your honorableness in facing this pain and being big enough and brave enough to, to feel it, including out of service to yourself. You know, As much as you would help another person bear it on its way out the door, you're helping yourself bear it on its way out the door, even here, your own material. So, Drawing on a sense of those who are inner nurturers, I call I call I talk about the caring committee inside different figures, inside you who are supportive. What might they be saying to you? 
uh, can you feel in relationship with them as you feel as you bear your pain? And then last uh, little suggestion here uh, is a little bit of an advanced one, but it's profound and it's certainly very much one that the Buddha and others um, have taught. It's to recognize the emptiness of all experiences. They exist. We're feeling them. We don't like feeling them because <laughs> they feel certain ways, let's say. And all experiences are insubstantial. All experiences are impermanent. All experiences are compounded, made of parts. All experiences occur depend interdependently, right? So as we tease apart the threads that comprise the knot of a painful, difficult, hijacking experience, we start seeing more space between the threads. The experience starts feeling more cloud-like, less brick-like, less essentialized, more spacious, and we become more identified with and aware of the spaciousness, the space of awareness and beingness in between the reactive threads. And we can do that even with the most difficult experiences of all. Okay, that was a lot. Hopefully that was useful. I better wrap it up. I better let you go. I better let Jacob go. Um, uh, I just want to say again that I really, really, really appreciate you doing this. Uh, I think a lot lately uh, as we experience physical distancing to slow the movement of this plague, you know, through our tribe, in the broadest sense, uh, understandably we do physical distancing to protect others as well as to protect ourselves. It's more important than ever to have empathic closeness, to feel empathically connected with others, even in our imagination. I'm not seeing any faces here, uh, but I'm imagining you. I'm imagining you, being all 85 of you, including Jacob, uh, including me, uh, uh, being here with us together. So I want to thank you uh, for participating. Uh, as we practice together, we can feel that we're in a field of practice with other people, uh, and we can feel buoyed by their practice. I feel buoyed by your practice and by your, by your interest in this material. And we can practice uh, in part as well for the sake of others. Uh, our practice, bit by bit, ripple by ripple, in ways seen and unseen, helps other people too, even in a world that is still very, very full of challenges. So thank you very much for your time here. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm reading the chats. I'm really appreciating them. I hope you Hope you liked my book. I think it's a really cool book. I go back and, and read it, uh, stuff in it. I'm like, oh yeah, it's pretty good stuff. I felt like I was curating a fantastic museum, wandering through with seven major halls, you know, uh, mostly the material of others, but I got to pull it together in my own way and I did add a few original notions to it. But it was just phenomenal to wander through the halls of steadiness, lovingness, fullness, wholeness, nowness, allness, and the, the vastest hall of all, timelessness. So thank you again very, very, very much. Blessings and bows to all of us, all beings. Take good care. Mm -hmm.